Welcome everybody to Huddle Up with Matias Bueno, episode 26. Today's guest is considered one of the greatest blue bombers of all time. The all-time Canadian Football League touchdown king, second in receiving yards in CFL history. 2002 most outstanding player in the CFL, Winnipeg Blue Bomber and Canadian Football Hall of Famer, the honorary Milt Siegel. Milt, thank you so much for joining today's episode. It is a, it is a privilege and an honor to be able to, to have you as a guest on the show. Well, thanks for having me on, but I, I wish I would have told you there was one thing you should have said about me that's even more important than all of that stuff. The prettiest man to ever play in the CFL, so you forgot to say that, but that's okay. You know, that's okay. <laughs> the, the word, the word is, it, the word is true that I've heard that you are the best looking man to have played in the CFL. I agree. I agree. I don't, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I agree. <laughs> I've also Thanks heard that. Having me on. I've having also me heard on. that you're the, amongst the fastest players to have ever played in the CFL. And, and to quote uh, former guest, Brett McNeil, he said that he never saw you get caught from behind. Is that true as well? Well, and, and yeah, man, I love Brett. Brett, uh, he blocked for me for years. Thank God. Uh, he allowed the quarterback to throw some great passes to me. So I definitely appreciate what Brett did for me for all those years. But I was never one of the fastest. The reason why I never got caught behind because of my, and not toot my own horn, but I guess I'm, because of my conditioning level. You know, a lot of guys who are fast, you know, they can get to their top speed pretty quickly, but then they start decelerating pretty quickly also me when I got to my top speed I can hold it for a long period of time so if you are faster than me if you don't catch me soon you're not going to catch me because my condition is going to allow me to stay at that top speed And if you get close to me I'm going to start zigzagging and make you run longer than you want to run so I was truly never one of the fastest it was just my conditioning level allowed me to to run at a high speed for the entire game so do you feel that you're still in you know a few weeks away or maybe a few months away of training from, from game day shape. I've heard also that you're one of the, the fittest players I've ever played in the league in terms of training regiment and, and ability to be prepared. I, I couldn't play in the game right now. If you gave me three years, let's be honest. I hear players say that all the time. Well, you give me I'm like, no, it's not going to happen. I'm 50 years old. Do I still train hard? Of course I do. I still go pretty hard, but nothing like I was doing when I was playing, you know, the stuff I went through when I was playing, it was, I was taking my body to the to the to the edge almost to death and then allow it to come back. Now I still work out, but there's no way uh, unless you can put your body, uh, my body on your head or whatever. That's the only way I'll be able to play. But I, I still train pretty hard. You know, I have a 16 year old, a 12 year old son. So it's fortunate that I'm still able to train hard with them. But there's no way in a million years I could go out and play a quarter of a football game right now. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that as a kid growing up being a Bomber fan that I always found confusing, and this may sound silly, but when I first started watching the Bombers, it was around the mid 2000s. And I remember that uh, it was, I think I was in grade four that you guys had had a good team and I got close. And then 2007 obviously was, was the great cup loss against Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. And then I remember that I was just starting to get familiar with the team. And then 2008 rolled around and that was the final season you played and you retired at the following off season. I right. remember saying to my parents, like, he can't retire. Like, can he keep playing? Like he's got to keep going. We <laughs> haven't won the great cup yet, but it's when, when looking into your story, it's crazy to think of the amount of time that you contemplate, the amount of times you contemplated retirement and, and the end of your career. And, and even in it's in 2005, which was, would have been eight years into your time with the bomb or nine seasons into your time with the bombers mm -hmm. towards the end of your CFL career in terms of talking about fitness, what what really made you decide to to retire and to be satisfied with that decision, especially considering you were still in great shape and still pushed through several years after the first time you contemplated it? Well, there, there was a few things. And you talking about talk about being in great shape and being in great shape is one thing. But being being able to take that pounding week in and week out is a different thing. Uh, I started playing football when I was four or five years old. So. Uh, when I retired, I had played, you know, 30 something years. And regardless of what type of shape you in, that's a lot of pounding on your body week in and week out, not just the games, but the practice, all the practice is also the stopping and the going and, and all that training you have to do that takes a toll on your body like nothing else. So you can lift all you want to, you can do all the running, you can have the correct diet, but just that everyday pounding is difficult when you're in your mid to late thirties, that was difficult in my body. Another reason, and this is funny, but it's true. Another reason why I knew I was retired. My last year 
there were honestly a couple of guys on the team where I could have dated their mother. I, I was 38 and their mothers were like early 40s. I'm like, hold on. That shouldn't be the case. That, that That's another sign. But the main reason was because of my family. You know, my wife and my oldest son at the time, Chase, was three. And we had just had uh, another son who was born in Winnipeg, Colin. He was just born. So that was the main reason. Of course, Father Tom was knocking on the door telling me, okay, I'm coming in. It's time for you to, it's time for you to go. But the main reason was, you know, my young family and being away from them. Uh, I, I couldn't continue doing that anymore. Uh, because it was a lot on my wife. So that was the main reason why I knew it was time to go. And obviously retirement and and from many of the guests that I've spoken to in previous episodes, it is a, is a difficult time in a football player's career because not only does it kind of feel a bit like a like a death because it's the end of, of a period of time that will never be able to be repeated, but also most players retire or stop their football career, not on their own terms. And Brett was a big advocate of talking about that in terms of his reluctance to get involved with alumni work because of people feeling that, that bitterness or that I could still play. Like we mentioned before, did you feel completely satisfied when you had retired despite not having achieved a a great cup win with Winnipeg? Oh, without a doubt. And I was fortunate. I was the what 1% maybe that got to go out on their own terms. I played professional football for 17 years and there's not too many individuals who can who can say that they played professional football for 17 years. So I had got everything I could get out of, get out of me. So of course I would have loved to win some great cups, one, two, three, four, five, and you know, 14 of for my 14 years in the CFL. But I knew that I had left everything on the field, every game, every practice, every single time I stepped on the field. So at the end of my career, I knew I could look in the mirror and say I was a champion because I did all I can do. Uh, like I alluded to, I mean, I left on my own terms. I was 38. And when I retired, I was 39 years old, you know. So uh, the fact that I was able to play that long and play at a pretty high level for a long time, I was fully satisfied. Of course, there are some things I miss about football, but it's not actually playing football. It's being in the locker room. It's interacting with the fans. It's running on the field. And this is one of the things that I miss more than anything is running on the field and looking up in the stands and seeing people with your jersey on or screaming your name. That's a drug and a high you can't get anywhere else. I always say you could pay me a billion dollars a year doing a job, but you can't get that gratification or satisfaction. You can't be satisfied as much as you are once you run out in the field and hear those fans screaming and cheering your name. Now, while those things are definitely, they're irreplaceable with football. And I think that's one of the things that many, many players talk to or talk about when it comes to the end of their career and, and getting that rush that you, you can't really repeat, right? Even like when, when guys finish playing high school football, you hear coaches say, you'll never strap up the pads as a senior ever again with these teammates. You'll never play with the same group of guys. And did you find that mm-hmm. as your career progressed, that there were a lot of those moments once you started to get into your thirties, because obviously like you mentioned with, how young guys were getting the some of the greatest times in your career, statistically speaking, were with Kahari Jones. And now he's a, a head coach in the league as a young head coach, but his career was finished not long after the time that you guys were at your peak. So what were some of those thoughts that were roaming through your mind and how did, how did you at least deal with it to, to, to keep pushing forward to play knowing that father time was starting to catch up? Well, it, it, and it's difficult because you see guys you you play with and you had a lot of success with. You talk about Kahari, uh, Robert Gordon, a couple other guys. You see these guys, Brett McNeil, a couple other guys. You see these guys slowly start, you know, they're not playing anymore. You start realizing, well, wow, you know, how much longer do I have left? But you have, you can't allow that to creep into your mind. You have to take everything one day at a time, especially when you get old. Now, when you're a little bit younger, you're thinking, oh, I'm invincible. I'm going to play another 50 years or whatever. But as you start getting up there in age, you start seeing guys you play with no longer playing on your team and other teams. You just start taking it day by day. You start to enjoy it a little bit more because you know the final day is sooner than later. You're, you're at the back end of your career. So you just try to enjoy it as much as you can. It, it's a little bit more difficult, of course, because I alluded to earlier. It's, more, it's a little bit more tougher on the body but you just start enjoying it and focusing on how can I make myself better today? How can I have some success with my team today? It's not about what's going to happen two years from now, what happened in the past. It's all about the moment. You have to stay in the moment. And once you do that, when you finally get to that point where you're no longer playing, it's a lot more enjoyable and you enjoy the times that you had uh, up to your retirement. 
And so looking at the transition that you made immediately after your career joining the CFL and TSN panel in the summer of 2009, did you find that there was a bit of a, a sigh of relief almost when you were able to really step back and look at the game from maybe more of an objective lens and be able to, to stay around football for longer without having to take that physical beat? And what really went into, did they look, did they seek you out or were you looking for an opportunity to stay around the game or how did that transition happen? Well, it, it was, it was the perfect uh, situation, perfect scenario. Uh, first of all, a gentleman named Brian Williams, who's worked in uh, the media for years. Uh, he was interviewing me at the gray cup and we were having some interaction and he, he said, you know, my tone, my, 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 the way I was handling things, he was like, you should look into, you know, going into TV or whatever. So he uh, reached out to a couple of people. And when I retired, TSN reached out to me and said, okay, we have an opportunity for you if you're looking forward to it. So, I mean, it, it was a great transition. It wasn't a smooth transition. It takes a while to get used to doing it. People just think we show up and we talk about, uh, football, we watch a game and we talk about it. There's a lot more that goes into it uh, besides that. But I was so fortunate to be able to make that transition to stay around football without actually playing football. There's so many guys who would love to be in that position. That's why I don't take it for granted. I'm always prepared. I'm always doing my work, trying to do my best because I know there's a guy, there's millions of guys looking to take my position. But I'm so fortunate to be able to do it. Uh, this would have been my 13th year doing it, hopefully 14th year next year when the season gets going next year. But it's I'm so fortunate to be able to stay around the game, still interact with some of the players, some of the coaches, and also work with a great group of guys, great group of guys. So every single morning I pinch myself to say, I've actually never worked a day in my life. I played 17 years of football, and now I'm actually getting paid to watch and talk about football. So I've been very fortunate. And it's an amazing group of guys that you have on the panel. And despite maybe some of the changes throughout the years that I think the CFL and TSN panel has done such a good job of really creating an excitement around the game, especially when watching and, and with the hosts to the analysts like yourself and Jock and David Sanchez and Henry Burris and all the, all the great minds of the game. So take us a little bit behind maybe some of the scenes of when you guys are in the studio. So you talk about it not being as simple as just showing up and talking is how much of the stuff that you guys talk about is ad-libbed in genuine conversation versus teleprompter or versus having to work with a bit more of a script? There's, there's never any teleprompter. There's, no, there's never any teleprompter. A lot of times, like when we have a pregame show, uh, we have a, 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 a pregame meeting, usually like two, two and a half hours, and we vaguely talk about the subjects that we're going to, uh, encounter, but we don't ever say, okay, this is what I'm going to say. This is what you're going to say. We want it to be as organic as possible because we don't want to look like robots, you know? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we may all agree on something, but we may have one individual disagree so we can create an argument. You know, you just don't want to be up there and everyone's hunky dory, you know? And a lot of times those arguments are organic. It's just off the rip. Uh, there's been some times where our lead guy, uh, Rod Smith, is talking. And, you know, our producer says something in his ear where, okay, Rob, we have to change this subject where all of a sudden someone may be talking. They say, we got to change this subject. There was some breaking news. So that happens. Uh, and the one thing that took forever for me to get used to is having that earpiece in your ear. I never knew why they had the earpiece in your ear, but the earpiece is in your ear because there may be somebody talking to you while you're talking. So you have to listen to them without listening to them. So uh, it's a transition. Uh, going from playing football to talking about football, but it's one I enjoy uh, every single day. And, and like I said, it, it's not easy, but as you do it more, when you work with a great group of guys, guys who uh, create that chemistry, it makes it so much easier. But there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, you know, sometimes I prepare two or three hours to talk for three or four minutes, you know? It's just the way it is. You never know how much time you're going to have. You never know when we're going to change the subject. So it's better to be over-prepared than under-prepared. And especially when you guys during the game are doing quick analysis, because I think one of the things that people don't understand is that, like you mentioned, there's hours of preparation for maybe a few minutes of screen time in between quarters and during commercial breaks. And that's it. Maybe for the great cup, maybe a little bit more if you're doing a pregame show, maybe they have people who are down by the field, et cetera. So when you guys are doing an analysis of the game, is there a bit of difficulty with learning the transition to watching the screen versus when they transition to showing the play on, 
on TV for the viewers? Or how do you guys handle being able to really dive into the analysis, maybe without breaking concentration or without having to, to take a big break? Do you guys have like the material in front of yourself to watch the plays? Well, I, I won't say we have the materials in front of us. This is where, you know, you, you, you just have so much information where you're able to continue talking. Uh, you know, we, we, so we're watching the first half and we see something we want to analyze, you know, and then our producer, uh, he sends it down to us. He shows us uh, the film we're going to see or the plays we're going to see. So as we're talking, he'll let us know, okay, I'm about to run the plays. And so the plays are running in and you just continue talking. And then after the plays has, has, has ran, you may talk a little bit more. And it all depends on uh, who you're passing it to, what you're going to say after your plays are ran. So it's just something that you just have to get used to over time. Of course, when I first started doing uh, doing it, it, it wasn't the smoothest, but it just comes with reps. Just, just like anything, it comes with reps. The more you do it, the more comfortable you get, the better you get at it. And that's just the way it works with us. Uh, of course, when I first stepped in there, you know, it was a little intimidating because I was dealing with guys, you know, Jock, uh, Matt Dunnigan, Chris Schultz. Those guys have been doing it for years and they just threw me right in the mix. There was no training, nothing. Just throw me right in the mix and threw me in the water and say, we're going to see if you can swim. And if you can't swim, we're going to find somebody else to see if they're going to swim. So I was fortunate to be able to get in and, and get in the mix and get my feet wet. And every single game, I started getting better and better and better. Uh, I had some people help me out. Chris Schultz helped me out a lot. Uh, Jamie Rydell helped me out a lot. A couple other people helped me out a lot because they knew that I wanted to be successful. So uh, I was able to get my feet wet, get going. And every single day, I'm still growing now. I'm still nervous every single time I get on air. But I think that's a good thing. It's like every single football game I played in. I was nervous from the first game I played into the last, ga last game I played in. But uh, I'm nervous because I want to do well. But I want to do, and I know I'm going to do well because I'm prepared. So it's a transition I love every single day. And especially when working, you mentioned some of the names like Matt Dunnigan, Chris Schultz, guys who had been around in the league. Do you find that there's a bit that the atmosphere started to become more fun once you start to get working with the guys and building that chemistry, especially because with some of the panelists who have now joined, like, like Henry Burris and David Sanchez was in, guys who you would have played against. Do you find that it becomes more fun over time or that there's still a bit of that um, different, there's a different dynamic between different groups and it's kind of individual and special to each, each group of guys that you're working with. No, no, that, that, that's a great point you bring up. And cause Davis and I, we had some battles and people don't notice, but Davis and I, we weren't the friendliest when we played. And now Davis, I mean, he, we, we talk all the time now, Davis and I, we have a great chemistry. Henry and I, we had a pretty good chemistry, but Henry was a quarterback. Davis and I, we actually battled against each other for some years. So the chemistry we have now is truly special. We talk a lot. Uh, we talk about some of the things we want to talk about on air. Even next year, we talk now and say, Davis, once we get on air, you know, because, you know, he was a DB and I was a receiver. We're going to talk about what happens when a DB goes in a receiver. We always wish we had more time so we can go into more detail uh, what a receiver is thinking versus what a DB is thinking. So it's great to have guys that you played against on, on the set with you because, you know, you can show some old film when I beat you or when you stop me or whatever. And it just forms uh, a great relationship that continues to grow every single time we're on air together. And especially speaking of the relationships that you have with former players and obviously with working with the crew, you know, you get, you guys get the opportunity to speak with coaches and really be involved in what goes into a game. And one of the things that I guess I want to bring up is related to a great and heart touching, very warm video that you had released prior to the great cup being played last year with the bombers. So the, the video that you had had talking about what your feelings were around the great cup and seeing Winnipeg be in it. And despite having that neutral position on television, always feeling like a Winnipeg blue bomber and always backing the pride of the blue and gold from Manitoba. Do you find that there is a bit of difficulty when you're watching games in terms of having a bit of a, maybe a, a hidden bias or maybe a bit of a, you have these recollections of moments playing against teams or players, or how do you find the balance between what you truly feel versus making sure to do your job in the most objective way possible for the viewers? Well, I, I have to be as honest as, 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 as possible, you know, transparent as possible. And, and, and some, especially early on, because I had just retired and there majority of the guys on the bombers, I played with them. So it was really difficult talking about them, but 
you know, they, they, they pay me to be honest, to be as, as unbiased as possible. And if the bombers aren't playing well, if an individual isn't playing well on the bombers, it's my job to, to critique that and to give my honest, honest opinion. To this day, it's still tough, you know, because the Bombers, I mean, they're in my heart. That is my team, you know, and every now and then or whenever it happens, I have to give my honest opinion about them. If, if they're not playing well, if something's not going on offense, if the scheme is not uh, up to par, it's my job to criticize them. And it's always in a fair way. It's nothing personal. It's definitely nothing personal with the Bombers. I just like with any team or with any individual in the CFL, I just like no one. But it's just my honest opinion. That's what I have to do. Like I said, it is tough, uh, uh, especially last year, Paul LaPolice, one of my favorite people in the world, big reason why I was able to score a bunch of touchdowns. Every now and then I have to say something about, bad about him, but he understands it. He was, in, he was in the business. Other coaches, other players in the league that I know pretty well. Most of them understand it. Some of them, some, especially you know, some of these younger guys, they're a little, little soft. I think you younger generation, you guys are a little bit softer than the older generation. But for the most part, people understand because when they do something well, we also give them that praise. It's just not a one-way street. It's both ways. You do well, we're going to give you the praise. But if you're not, we definitely have to criticize you because otherwise we lose all credibility if we don't criticize when they don't do bad. Of course, and especially with, I guess, the unfortunate era that Winnipeg continued through after your playing career and up until Michael Shea and Kyle Walters and Wade Miller had joined forces, it is tough, obviously, seeing a team so close to your heart go through difficult periods of time in terms of seasons that maybe don't go well or having to critique a team that you know is very close to your heart. But when it comes down to it, I think from my perspective as a, as a viewer and as a fan that you guys do a really good job of being objective and making sure to have fair analysis amongst all teams, despite obviously Henry Burris having played for Ottawa, having played for Calgary, having played for Saskatchewan and you having played for Winnipeg for all those years, Davis having played for BC. And when it came to watching the great cup, a part of your job, what was the feeling like for you to see Winnipeg win? And now obviously you weren't a player for the team, but how mm -hmm. did you resonate with the enjoyment of, what it meant for the city of Winnipeg and what it meant for the blue bomber faithful to see it finally all come together after all the years that you were on the team and saw them not make it. Right. Right. And that's what it was all about. You know, I, I was overjoyed for the players, for the coaches. I mean, like I mentioned, Paul, La police, one of my favorite, not only coaches, but people in the world, Michael Shea, you know, they, 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 they stayed the course. They were patient with everything they had going on. Kyle Walters, the GM, he made one of the, greatest uh, moves at the end of the season, bringing in Zach. So I was overjoyed and happy for all those guys. But the majority of my happiness was for those fans, you know, for those fans who've been waiting around 30 years, those loyal fans who uh, for 14 years uh, stuck with, uh, with me and the teammates, even though we couldn't get it together, but were there for the ups and downs, uh, the organization. There were still people in that organization who had been there forever. Head equipment guy, Brad Foddy, who's been there since the early 90s, waiting for that ring for him to finally get it, and for the province of Manitoba. You know, it, it was such a special thing to see everyone there. There were so many fans there, but I'm for sure that parade uh, when they went back to Winnipeg was something crazy. So that was the main reason I was so happy because those fans and those loyal fans uh, have been waiting for 30, almost 30 years, and they were finally able to say, we're finally Grey Cup champions again. So that was something special to see. And especially or in relation to your career, when talking about the Great Cup, obviously you haven't played during an era that really set the story for the 2019 Great Cup. Because if you really think about what made 2019 so special, without five Great Cup losses before, it wouldn't have meant as much and it wouldn't have been as big of a deal. So in terms of when you were in the midst of your playing career, obviously 2001 being probably the, one of the closest chances that Bomber fans would say you guys came to win in the Great Cup. How did you deal with looking back on your career, knowing that you weren't able to win the great cup, but felt still felt that satisfaction of knowing you left everything on the field. Is it a difficult feeling to balance as a player once you retire, or do you find that there is still peace that comes with great cups that have arrived in Winnipeg or the great cup that has arrived in Winnipeg since? Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. I mean, at the end of the day, it's football. It's a kid's game. It's not life and death. And I mean, I, I talked about it earlier, I would love to win those great cups, but, you know, I, I did all I can do. You know, I did all I can do. I played as hard as I could. And when I see the Winnipeg organization win a great cup, 
I'm, it's just as happy I would be if I won a great cup because I know there's so much that went into that. I know Wade Miller was uh, staying up late nights, Mike O'Shea, Paul La Police, all those guys, everyone on that team was doing everything in, 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 in their best interest to make sure that the Winnipeg organization and the province of Manitoba uh, won that great cup. So uh, I wasn't part of the team but I am part of that organization. I am part of the community in Winnipeg and Manitoba. So it was almost like a fan almost. I was almost like a fan saying, I'm, I'm, I'm happy too. This is something I've been waiting for uh, since 1995, since I stepped in Winnipeg. So it's, it's, it's something special to see. And I know it's difficult uh, for some players who played there for years and wasn't able to win that Grey Cup and they see this happen, but that's definitely not the case for me because I'm all part of not just the Winnipeg organization, but the community of Winnipeg and the entire province of Manitoba. And you mentioned the first time you stepped on the field in Winnipeg, halfway through the season in 1995, and you went through many different eras with the Blue Bombers and played against players who are now coaching in the league and was were coached under, or were you had the opportunity to be coached by people who are now, since removed from the league, still have a relationship with players and still have that that their their name in the ring having played in the early, the late nineties under Jeff Reinbold and having played with Dave Ritchie on having played under Doug Barry, and then having played with Paul Apolise. So when you look at the relationship you have with coaches and with people that were a part of your career as a player, do you find that is an extra special bond when you're done playing and when you get that opportunity to really let go of the pads and let go of strapping up the boots, because now you guys share that one, camaraderie of having been CFL alumni because especially with Mike O'Shea he was a guy that you would have played against when he was in the Argos in the mid-2000s having him right. himself also being a Canadian Football Hall of Famer and now being a part of an organization an organization that means so much to you so what is what is that relationship like when you see former opponents finally transition in a position where you are now a part of the same organization or kind of on on the same page with with where they are in their career yeah no it, it's good you talk about Mike O'Shea you talk to Hari Jones uh Paul Police, who was my, you know, my coordinator for years, uh, for a couple of years. He's uh, he's, he's coach, head coach in Ottawa now. It, it, it's great to see. And uh, some of the re my best relationships are with some of my former coaches. I talked to Doug Barry. I talked to Dave Ritchie. I still stay in touch with uh, uh, Jeff Reinbold. Uh, you know, they, these are guys who are more than just football coaches. You know, they're, they're, they're pretty good friends. Bobby Dice who was my receiver coach for years. I still stay in touch with him. And those are things you cherish more than anything. You know, of course, uh, we, 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 we battle together on the football field, but those relationships, those are relationships that will last forever. Those are friends that are forever. And that's what, those are the things you cherish. But it, it, it's great to see guys I've played with and against out there coaching. You know, they, they just let you know how uh, intelligent they are because you just can't have – just because you were a great player doesn't mean you're going to be a great coach. It doesn't always work that way. We've seen that in the past. I won't say any names, but we've seen that in the past. It has to be more than that. You have to be a motivator. You have to be able to lead men. You have to be able to uh, uh, bring your coaches together. You're dealing with so many different personalities within a team, not only with your coaching staff, but more importantly, within your players, different attitudes. Uh, you don't know mentally what players are going through, family, all this stuff. And as a head coach, you have to be able to be the executive director of all this, stay calm, stay cool, stay collective. And I think that's one of the better traits of Mike O'Shea. He's always even kill. He doesn't get too high, doesn't get too low. He's always even kill. And you always ask his players what they love about him the most. And they say, that's the best thing. You know, he's the always an even kill guy. So when I see these players I've played with and against having success as a, as a coach, it's really nice to see. And now, with the, you mentioned the relationship that you have with all the coaches you played with during your time in Winnipeg. Do you find that there's any of those coaches who you would say are, were your favorite to play under, or do you find that there's really great things you liked about all the coaches that were leading the team during your time in Winnipeg? Well, I, I loved all the coaches I played with. Of course, my, my two favorite, and it, it's, it's their neck and neck, uh, Doug Barry and Dave Ritchie. I enjoy both of them now, but the one I had the, greatest experience I think that changed my football career and people want to say I'm crazy was Jeff Reinbo. When Jeff Reinbo got there in 97, I always say we didn't win too much, but Jeff Reinbo made losing fun. He was just such an entertainer. But the one thing he told me because I wasn't, I was Milton Stiegel. I wasn't Milt Stiegel yet. And he told me going into the, to the season, 
this is your team. I need you to be that leader on and off the field. I know you're the leader by working hard, but now I need you to be the leader. I'm going to allow this offense to build around you. I'm going to showcase you. And he told, he told me, they don't know who you are now, but I guarantee you at the end of this season, this entire country, the entire CFL will know who you are. So Jeff Reinbold had a, it was a big reason why I was able to, to go on to do great things in the CFL. Of course, like I said, we didn't win many games, but that year he showcased my skills and allowed me to go and play on and have a, as they say, a, a CFL Hall of Fame career. So like I say, he, but the, I, I know who my best coaches were, but Jeff Reinbold had an impact uh, like no other on me in my CFL career. And it's such an important thing, that relationship between a coach and a player. And one of the former, one of the former guests that I've had on my podcast and I had the privilege of speaking to Angus Reed, a former BC Lion and mm-hmm. public speaker, talking about his relationship with coach Dan Durazio from the Lions and saying, there's such a powerful feeling and surge within you when a coach believes in you. And when a coach tells you, you can do it, especially yeah. you look at yeah. Jeff Reinbold and for those most of the demographic of our listeners are people around my age and maybe those who aren't as familiar with Jeff when he was dr- with his time in Winnipeg, but Jeff was a very entertaining guy. And, and while yeah. the Bombers weren't <laughs> a great team in the late nineties, as, as you, you may know, and for those who understand Bombers history, Jeff was still a very fiery character. And he was kind of like a John Gruden, in the CFL, you know, like people <laughs> knew that he was a very outstanding character, the way he acted, but that belief and that, you're a Milt Stiegel. You're not Milton Eugene. You're a Milt Stiegel. And that right. belief within yourself really showed. It was your first all-star nod in the CFL in 97. And from that time until 2008, only had one year where you didn't, if, if I am correct, one year where you didn't have a thousand receiving yards. Mm-hmm. And that was, I believe it was the following year, if I'm not mistaken, but you look right, at the, because I went to the NFL and came back. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. Like yeah. if you look at the mm-hmm. amount of success that you had based on that belief, he didn't, it, it was like in Space Jam, right? Just, this is Michael's secret stuff. It's just water, but that illusion that there is, or maybe not illusion, but the the trans the, the, the transcendent belief that you can do it really makes a, a big impact. And, and obviously with the coaches that you had, you know, there's a difference between someone that is really good versus someone that knows how to motivate, even if the team doesn't win. So in relation to the coaches that you talked about with Doug Barry and with Dave Ritchie, what were some of the best things that they did that really you found gave them the opportunity to find success with the team considering that both of them were coaches that played in the 2001 great cup and also the 2007 great cup. Well, the, like they had their, their systems, but they allowed, uh, they, they allowed some, some deviation from the system, especially offensively. Uh, a lot of people, well, some people don't know when I'm route running, I'm, I'm reading the defense as I'm route running. And if I see something, that I can exploit, I'll change up my route. I'll change up my route. And I was fortunate enough, Kahari and, and Kevin Glenn, they had played with me long enough. They knew, kind of knew when I was going to do that because they were reading the defense also. So these were two coaches and Paul LaPolice, he was a big part of this also. They allowed me to deviate within the scheme of the offense. There was no, I was never interrupting any of the other receivers. I always knew what the other, every single receiver had on every single route. So I knew what route to deviate on and where to go. And both of these guys allowed me to do that. But more important than that, they were just good individuals. You know, it's it's easy when you go to work and your boss is a good person. I'm sure there's people out there who play sports, wherever you may work, and you just hate going to work because of your boss or the individuals you have to work with. They were just good. And all the coaches I played with were good individuals, but Doug Barry and, 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 and Dave Ritchie, they were just good family men, good individuals. They cared more than just about what were you doing on the football field. You know, they were somewhat nonchalant and they were somewhat old school, old fashioned, but they were good individuals. And that just makes life easier, especially when you're spending that much time with them. It just makes life easier when you're dealing with some good individuals. And you mentioned that ability to deviate from the offensive scheme and a quarterback, Kahari Jones, for those who may not have been able to watch his playing career, and the word is that he was a bit of a, a deviator himself when it came to running an offense. And that when, when when I was speaking with Nick Lewis on a previous episode, he talked about Kahari's ability to, when he first came out to the league, he said, okay, you run this, you run a post, run a fly, <laughs> run an out and go do whatever. And he thought, he's like, is this for real? Like, is this like schoolyard football? But Kahari was such an excellent thrower of the ball that 
you could see it in the success you guys had in the early 2000s. You can see it in the success that he had when he was playing in Calgary and, and to see mm-hmm. him succeed and use that knowledge and that intelligence, that raw football IQ in Montreal, I think that they're going to be a very successful football team going forward based on his ability to know the offense very well and to be able to know the ebbs and flows of it. But what was it like playing with Gahari in those, in those first first few years that he was on the Bombers in 2000 and when you guys started to get rolling when, before your MLP season on, in 02? Kahari and I, we, we had a special relationship. Uh, we were able to communicate without communicating, uh, especially in 2001, had MVP year. We would do things where no one on the sideline or even no one on the field, on the offensive side with us knew we were doing. I mean, it would be a run play and Kahari and I would see things where we knew they were like going to cover zero or something. Cover zero is basically where they're trying to blitz more guys where it was basically man-to-man coverage, me against a guy on the other side and no one else. And we would read that and he would throw it up and I would go make a play. So we had a special bond that was formed over time, but our chemistry together was truly great. Uh, a lot of this happened because we spent and he would have people over to his house all the time, uh, you know, barbecues. And that's when you really start forming those bonds. People think it always happens on the field. A lot of it happens on the field, but a lot of it happens too. When you spend time with guys off the field, you start to learn them. You start to learn about their families, about their background, and then you really start to get into them. And so when you get on the field, you know, you, 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 you have a, 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 a relationship like this is my brother and I want to be successful for my brother. And some of the things we're able to do, I mean, it, it was truly special. Kahari, along with Kevin Glenn also, he sacrificed a lot of his well-being for me to go out there and score a lot of touchdowns because he would wait till the last second sometimes to throw me the ball. But, I mean, I owe a lot to, to Kari and Kevin for all the success I had. And, uh, like I say, sometimes they may pay for it now with some of the ailments, but it was truly special playing with Kahari Jones and, and also Kevin Glenn because, I mean, they made life a lot easier for me. And especially with that relationship you have with Kari Jones, with having watched the highlights of you guys – of the season you guys had in 01 and 2002, 2002, a team that I would argue probably could have and should have won, went to and won the great cup as well, that maybe some Winnipeg fans aren't aware of, but the MOP season you had in 02 and the MOP season he had in 01 was just absolutely outstanding. And especially in the great cup, despite not coming out away with the victory, the late touchdown catch you guys had to pull the game that you had to pull the game within a score with five minutes left in the fourth is still one of the most unbelievable touchdown catches in <laughs> cup history. And t- talk, talk about that play. Like, what, what was it that went into, you know, what your thoughts were when you had three guys draping you like, on your arm, draped on you. And the, for fans who were not old enough to have watched that game, the previous play, you guys threw the ball the same way. You guys, it, mm-hmm. Kahari chucked a bomb in the deep right part of the end zone. I'm not sure if, I don't, I don't think it was to yourself. I think it was to an, Arlen Bruce, I'm not sure. Arlen Bruce. I think exactly. it was to Arlen yes. Bruce, if, if yes. I'm not mistaken. Yes. But talk about mm-hmm. that play. What what went into, like, from the huddle to what your thoughts were when the ball was up versus, like, what Kahari may have said to you after? Well, when I came out of the huddle, he gave me that look, like, regardless what's going on, I'm coming to you. It's time to make a play. I need you to make a play. I don't care if the entire, uh, the entire defense is on you. I'm going to come to you, and I need you to make a play. And when your quarterback gives you that look, when you know it's time to make a play, you got to make a play. So the route I ran wasn't the best. And it wasn't the best because I couldn't run a regular corner route because I knew, you know, there was going to be somewhat of a double coverage and regular run, run a regular corner route wouldn't put me in the best position. So my position was I'm just trying to get to the spot where I can shield off uh, the guy who was covering me and possibly the safety, Red Frayers, who was also going to be shading towards my side. So Kahari, I mean, I made a great catch, but the throw was incredible. It was a throw that was a way, because uh, the, the guy who was covering, he couldn't see it too much, but the safety had a good view of the ball coming. So Kahari put it in a place where basically it was either going to be caught by me or it was going to be incomplete. So he put it in a place. I made a play. Uh, it, it was a great catch, and it gave, gave us an opportunity. But, I mean, it, it's not surprising coming from Kahari. Uh, he made a... a he knew it was time to make a play. I knew it was time to make a play, and we made a play. So that got us back in the game. Unfortunately, we weren't able to finish it. But, I mean, I still look at that play as one of the greatest moments in my CFL career. And especially with, you mentioned the end, that you guys weren't able to, to get off that final shot. Joe Fleming, the top defensive player at Sakhar Jones with no time on the clock, 
Do you believe in your mind if Kahari had gotten the chance to take the shot that you guys would have repeated that play to tie the game? <laughs> uh, you know what? I, 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 I don't live like that. I don't live like that. It, it's just as when people always say, well, if you would have had Kevin Glenn in 2007, you would have won a great cup. I didn't win a great cup. That, that's the way I look at things. I never look at if ands, if this would have happened, no. If Kahari would have got it off, no. Kahari didn't get it off, so it doesn't matter anyway. So uh, that's that's the way I look at life. That's the way um, I, I've had success. I never worry about if this would have happened, if that would have happened. If I'd have been 6'6", six, six, I may have been in the NBA. Who knows? But I'm, I'm six feet tall, so this is where I am now. So I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But I just know what happened. He got sacked, and we didn't win the game. And talking about amazing throws the quarterbacks have made, you mentioned Kevin Glenn. Now, moving on to him, one of the most iconic calls that I would argue that Chris Cuthbert's ever made in CFL history. And to <laughs> quote yourself, not one of the only greatest touchdowns in CFL history, but in football history, in June or July, I think it was, July 20th, 2006, in Edmonton, right. mm-hmm. with four seconds left, you guys were down by four points. And, or I think it was three points and you guys had the ball on the 10 yard line and it was second and long and, and you made an unbelievable catch to go a hundred yards, take it the distance, win the game with no time on the clock. Take us through what happened on that play. Was it basically just hail Mary trips? All right, everybody go make a play because you talked a little bit on the, on the, the CFL special from TSN that talked about that play. You said that they were playing a bit of a, a weird defense. They weren't playing prevent, or maybe they were playing something that didn't put them in position to make a play. So what was it that actually happened on the miracle catch? And, and, and I hate to use this word, but they weren't playing a weird defense. They were playing a dumb defense. I, I hate to use that word because I tell my sons all the time, don't call anybody dumb. I'm not calling any individual dumb. I'm calling mm. the defense they played dumb. And it was crazy because the play before that, uh, we basically same, ran the same route and Kevin threw the ball. And I had, almost had a chance of catching it. So I'll come back to the huddle and Kevin and I look at each other like, did you see the defense they just played? And I'm going to be honest, neither one of us thought we had a chance of making that play. I mean, we need to go 100 yards. And, you know, we, we saw the defense they played before that. We couldn't believe it, the play before, but we just came back and said, did you see the defense they played? He's like, yeah, I couldn't believe it. So let's, let's run the same play. It's like, oh, okay, let's see what happened. So drop back. He threw the ball. I caught it. I think I turned invisible because two guys missed me and I, and I ran and scored a touchdown. And, and I couldn't believe it. I actually thought I was dreaming until I got in the end zone and Chris Brazel tackled me, my own player. It was the hardest hit I took the entire game. But, I mean, that was just a special play. And everything just leading up to that play. I don't know if you remember, but our, our, our possession before that, we could have sealed the game. And Kevin had a quarterback sneak, and he's just trying to get some extra yards, and he fumbles the ball. So he fumbles the ball. They get it back. They score a touchdown. They go for the two-point conversion. They go up by four. And then they kick off, and then we get a penalty on it. So we had to move back 10 yards. So we're basically on the, you know, the 10-yard line. So no one's thinking that we have a chance. But as they say, you know, no lead is safe in the CFL. And, and we were able to produce that touchdown and win the game. I remember watching the highlights of that when I was first a young kid, you know, and I remember seeing Doug Barry running on the sideline and twirling <laughs> his arms and his headsets right, falling off. Right, and he was just right. so excited. Like, had you ever seen Doug Barry so excited in your seal fucker? That, that was the first time I ever seen Doug Barry run. You know, he, he coached, he coached me for three years, but I had never seen Doug run. Never. He was always a slim guy. I don't know how he stayed slim, but that was the first time I ever seen him run. But just everything about that game, like you talk about Doug Barry running down. I remember, Troy Westwood and all those guys coming down, jumping on me. And that's a memory that I try to think about all the time because those are some of the best times I had in the CFL, reliving those type of memories, getting on the plane with the guys. I remember getting back to Winnipeg and fans waiting for us at the airport. Those are the things that I miss about not playing football right there. I had a conversation with Ed Tate in a previous episode. And at the very end before it wrapped up, I asked him, so Ed, what's the weirdest game that you've ever covered? And I was thinking, because I actually didn't know what he would say or what what kind of answer he'd give to a weird game. I've seen a lot of games in Bombers history, the losses and wins, but without a second thought, he said to me, the Milt Stiegel 100 yard catch. And I was like, why, is, why was it weird? Like, isn't that so amazing? And, you know, lo and behold, for all the fans and for Chris Cuthbert, Glenn Suter, all the yelling and jumping and screaming, he said, he's like, in the press box, 
The second that he caught it, we got our story written. We got to send it to the free press, like <laughs> the very same minute. And the second he caught the ball, like you'd think people are jumping and excited. People are throwing F-bombs and curses and they're so upset. And they're like, we got to rewrite a whole 300 word story in one minute because he scored a touchdown in the final play of the game. And, and Ed said that he, he thought that the story kind of came out weird because he had been writing about all the bombers. They, they blew this lead, you know, the Kevin Glenn fumble, all these things. And, oh, but Milt Stiegel scored a, 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 a touchdown to, to save the day. So it's interesting how there's so many perspectives to these iconic stories and especially the other day i was watching cfl putting out a spe or the the tsm putting out a special in the cfl the greatest catches ever and then they had a special right after that said 100 top 100 catches of all time in sports and your catch went from like being like number two to like number 20 and i'm like how like that is the longest game-winning <laughs> touchdown in the history of pro football because in the nfl right. they can't have 100 yard touchdowns so so it's just so crazy to see and to really dive into the details of some of these amazing plays and, and, you know, the confidence that you have, especially when talking about it still to this day is unmatched. And I think that really speaks to your ability to have success, because if you're not believing in yourself, then how can you, yeah. you know, look at a defense and say, well, let's go score a hundred yard touchdown catch. So with, with working with, with having worked with Kevin Glenn, what were some of the best things about your relationship with him in terms of once he took over in mid 2004 and when he carried on the last few years of your CFL career, what did it mean to play alongside him in terms of him also having been a CFL journeyman, having played with every team and having played mm -hmm. for 15 plus years? It, it, it was almost like Kahari 2.0. Uh, you know, when Kevin, when Kevin got there, Kahari was a starter, but uh, Kahari, unfortunately, you know, he had taken too many hits and his shoulder was a, uh, uh, was deteriorating a little bit, so they knew a transition was coming. But Kahari had 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 ingrained in Kevin. This basically, this is what you need to do when you're working with Milt. So when Kevin came in, we almost didn't miss a beat because Kevin, you know, he had practiced with us some. You know, he practiced with us some, but a lot, and he understood the way I played the game, and I started understanding uh, what he was seeing, the way he played the game. So. It was a nice, smooth transition when Kevin stepped in in 2004. Uh, he understood how I viewed defenses when I was going to make adjustments, when I was going to make changes, and it just made life so much easier. Of, of course, it can be difficult playing with me sometimes because I, I am making some changes. They may call an out, right, out route, a six-yard out, and I may turn it into a go route because of the things I see, but Kevin would step right in, and we didn't miss a beat. So... I was just so fortunate to go from Kevin, I mean, from Kahari and straight to Kevin. I mean, they were so uh, similar in the way they handled things, uh, their attitude. Uh, the Kevin was, wasn't was as even killed as Kahari. Like, Kahari never got mad. Kevin, now, every now and then, he was a little sensitive. He was a little soft around the edges. He would get mad a little bit. But for the most part, he was a great quarterback and a great person to play, play with, just like Kahari Jones. And like I say, those two guys, without those two guys, I'm not a CFL. I'm not even close to being a CFL Hall of Famer because uh, just like Kahari, as I mentioned, just like Kevin, they sacrifice a lot of their well-being for me to score a lot of touchdowns. And for all Bomber fans who have grown up during my age range in the mid-90s to the 2000s, having seen two amazing Bomber quarterbacks back-to-back -back was really, truly a treat. And honestly, after Kevin Glenn left, there was a lot of uncertainty around the quarterback position in Winnipeg up until Matt Nichols came in and what I would argue is saved the franchise because if it was not for him having taken over for Drew Willie and his win, his first win as a Winnipeg blue bombing or blue bomber starting quarterback was the first win in Edmonton since your hundred yard touchdown catch. I remember listening to that game on CGLB at work, yep. which yep. is an interesting yep. little stat that there is significance in a period of time between one of the greatest players and the Bombers ever pulled off and one of the most important wins that a Bomber quarterback has ever had, because had it not been for that, Winnipeg may have let go of Michael Shea or may have let go of the rest of the mm. coaching staff. And it's so interesting to not have to wonder or worry about that and just know that that led the course for the future. But in relation to quarterbacks that you have played with, it's very interesting that I never knew before as a kid that two of the quarterbacks that are, I guess the other three quarterbacks in the roster besides Kevin Glenn in that 2007 team are now all successful coaches in the Canadian yes. and the national football league. So talk about what 
went on behind the scenes in terms of hearing that news or maybe the relationship that you developed a little bit with Zach or with Cliff and obviously also with uh, with Ryan because Ryan is now a head coach in Toronto and, and Zach and Cliff are down in Arizona and Cincinnati respectively. So what was your thoughts on seeing that news come up or maybe did you know some things before that? Because after 2007, people didn't really think or know about them much, but what right. was your thoughts on 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 their their journey through a coaching career in pro football? Well, not surprised at all. Uh, I, I I don't remember. Uh, well, I didn't spend too much time with Zach, uh, but Cliff being the head coach, not surprising at all. His 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 approach to the game. It was more like a coach than a player. The way he uh, paid attention to detail, the way he would help out uh, Kevin uh, when things you know this is what you need to see. Not surprising at all. And he somewhat alluded to the fact once he left in 2007 uh, that he was going into coaching. He had some leads. He he knew some people. He talked about that he was going into coaching. So once he finally started getting such success, when he went to got the head job at his alma mater at Texas Tech, then went to USC, that was the quick stop. Then he got the head coaching job at Arizona. Wasn't surprised about that all the time. Same way with Ryan Dinwiddie. You asked, talk to Ryan Dinwiddie and ask him what I used to say to him all the time. I'm like, you're going to be a coach. It's just a matter of time. You're going to be a coach. That's the way they approach the game. It was more than just being a quarterback. They approach the game like a coach. And that's what you want to see. Especially when your backups are doing that, you know your head guy is going to be successful. There was no hate in that, uh, that quarterback room. They were all about helping Kevin be successful. And it was unfortunate that Ryan's first start was, of course, in the biggest game of his career. But he, his mindset, the way he thought about things was crazy. Same way with Cliff. Those guys, they understood the game uh, like very few people I've been around. And so it's not surprised that they are head coaches. And I guarantee you all of them will have to su- continue to have success for long years to come. Unfortunately, Zach, uh, he's in the he's at, he's at the graveyard of the NFL. My former team, the Cincinnati Bing. It's hard to have success with the Cincinnati. If he can pull that off, he will definitely be a Hall of Fame coach because there's very few people that have success with the Cincinnati Bengals. But it's it's good to see all those guys, uh, head coaches in the NFL and the CFL. And for many Winnipeg longtime Blue Bomber fans, they know that you started your career down in Ohio playing for the Bengals for a few years before coming up to the CFL. So what were the first few years like being with Cincinnati? Obviously, it was during a time when it was right after the last playoff win that they had had with it yes. being 91. So what were the... What were those few years like in Cincinnati? Because obviously those aren't, that's not one of the biggest things that people tout when talking about the legendary Milt Stiegel. So what yeah, was it like it, playing for Cincinnati? It, it, it was, it, I will say it's the gift and the curse. The great thing was I'm originally, I grew up in Cincinnati. So I was playing from a hometown team, but I always say uh, the greatest thing or the best thing I got out of playing the NFL was a 401k and a pension because it wasn't it wasn't that much fun. You know, I'm at the bottom of the totem pole. So, you know, my playing time was basically special teams. I'm running down on kicks. I'm not saying it wasn't fun. Running down on kicks, running down on punts, returning kicks, returning punts. I mean, I scored one touchdown in my NFL career. And when you're at the bottom of the totem pole on a losing team, what happens is it's a revolving door. Guys are being placed every single week, every single week. Tuesday is the day off in the NFL. So I would go in and get a workout in. And every Tuesday, they would fly guys in and work them out. And if they saw a guy they'd like, they would sign that guy. And if you sign a guy, that means you have to delete a guy off your roster. So every single time I came back to work on Wednesday, I'm thinking like, is this it? I would lose guys who were my friends every single week when you're losing. So it was, uh, it, it, you know what? I, I I enjoyed it to a certain degree, but it was tough because, like I said, I'm at the bottom of the totem pole when you're losing. You don't know what's going to happen day to day. So I was fortunate enough to get those three years in. Uh, and then once I got to the CFL, that's when I got back to having fun playing football again. And I think that that's a trend that actually carries amongst guys that get some of the few NFL opportunities. Now, obviously, there are guys who have played in the NFL and made great careers out of being down south. Obviously, some recent examples being Cameron Wake right. of the New Orleans Saints and was a former BC Lion. And you look at during the time that you were just entering the league, the Rocket Ismail obviously had a great NFL career. So there are guys that do benefit and I'm sure have tons of fun, but with some of the former guests I had on being 
and James West, James Murphy, and mm. some of those guys talking about, uh, you know, even when Tyrone Jones was playing one year in the NFL and then came back to the CFL. Do you find that there is a bit of a difference in terms of the outlook on guys that play in the CFL with their community and with how they're viewed versus guys who are in the NFL? Because I think that there is a bit of a, a weird, I guess, view on players in the two leagues that while obviously everyone loves watching the NFL, there is something very charming about the CFL. And, and can you speak a bit about that in terms of your experience? Yes. Yes. I mean, it, it, it's, it's almost like um, it, it's more clickish in the NFL. And this is just my experience. I mean, there were guys on the team who would not uh, communicate with you if you weren't in the same tax bracket at them. It's just the way it was. You know, if you were, like I said, I was at the bottom of the totem pole and the guys at the top of the totem pole, they just didn't communicate with you. I mean, they would say hi, but that was just about it. You know, they felt they were on a different level and they were put on a different level by the coaches, by the fans, everyone within the NFL put those guys on a different level. So they felt they were a different human being than the guys like myself on the bottom of the totem pole. You know, they, they, they felt they were untouchable. Uh, and then when you get to the CFL, it's totally different. For the most part, everyone's on the same level. There's more interactions with the fans. You're, you're more uh, uh, indulged in the community. And it's just so much more laid back. Of course, the money's not the same. I mean, you're dealing with so many more people in the States than you're on the, uh, in the Canada. But the feel you have, the, the, the attitude, the mentality, it's so much more fun. It's so much more laid back. You ask anybody who's played in the NFL, and the CFL, and I guarantee you 100%, they would all say, if I could make the money playing in the CFL that I'm making in NFL, I would choose it over the 100% of the time. But the big money, all the marketing, that's the reason why guys are always trying to get to the NFL because, I mean, you, you, you can't beat the money. But as far as the, 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 the joy and the excitement you have and the interaction with the fans, there's nothing, nothing like playing in the CFL. Nothing like it. When talking about the differences between playing in the NFL and the CFL, it makes me think of a, another certain play that is famous in terms of CF, uh, you know, TSN top tens when they talk about the CFL. And it, I believe it happened in 2000, if I'm not mistaken, when you guys were playing against Calgary and when you went up for a jump ball and it was caught at the same time as the defensive mm. back. And mm. this young fellow had been down to the NFL and pulled the Sharpie out of his shoe and yes, signed the Kelly, ball. Kelly then, yes, yes, yeah. Yes. And then the ref <laughs> goes back and says, Oh, dual possession is a touchdown. And, and you, and, and when watching that, I found it so funny because obviously, you know, knowing the rules and, and the influence of Terrell Owens at the time was it created just that atmosphere, right? That swagger, that entertainer, rather than, you know, that, that fan, that fan based player. So talk about that play in particular. What, what actually happened in terms of like the result of the game and how you felt afterwards and what your interactions were like with with him afterwards when he finally spent that bit of time in Winnipeg yeah uh Kelly great guy great human being but as you mentioned Kelly had spent some time down in uh, San Francisco with Terrell Owen so he was a little influenced by him but uh it was it was, a, it was a jump ball and we both went up for it and originally I caught it but then when I came down he was actually able to you know put his hands on it so we're both on the ground and we're tugging back and forth and I think by the time that happened you know it's already ruled a touchdown but he was able to pull it away from him when we're on the ground so he just assumed it's an interception so I'm gonna gloat a little bit I'm gonna sign the ball blah 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 well he got his bubble burst and uh it came back and it was a touchdown my way but Kelly and I when he got to the to the to Winnipeg Blue Bombers we joked about it I would tease him every now and then in practice I remember one time I would catch a ball and I would joke like I was signing on him or whatever. But Kelly, I mean, he's one of the best human beings you can ever meet. He's a great guy. We always have fun with it. It was just him in the moment, you know, he was feeling himself. Terrell Owens thing. But unfortunately, uh, I can't remember too many times anyone's going to jump up with me and catch a ball. And, and I, I'm, I'm not the recipient of a touchdown. So, like I said, we had fun with it for years to come. And it was just one of my, it was a great play uh, that I was able to make. And it's, it's always great to hear about the fun that guys have. And especially when you move on to different teams or when you're done playing, you're able to joke around with about certain plays because not, not, you know, festering in, in anger or bitterness about things that didn't go your way, I think is an important characteristic and trait to carry as a professional football player. And, and because you are just that right, a professional and 
it's important to still maintain that rapport because you are being watched by fans, being watched by so many people. And it's not always just about yourself as much, as much as great players obviously have confidence in themselves. And in terms of the three most iconic touchdowns, I would argue that you've scored being the one yard pitch from Kevin Glenn in 2007, uh -huh. the record breaker of Alan Pitts's um, most uh, breaking Alan Pitts's record in 2008 against the Argos. And then obviously the 100 yard touchdown catch, which of those three do you see as your favorite touchdown catch amongst those? Or do you find that there's something very special about all of them? Cause obviously they all carry so much iconic weight. Well, they're, they're all special and there are a couple others that are special too, but I mean, breaking an all time touchdown record that that's, that's, the, <laughs> that's the special one. I mean, that, that when you think about, the objective in football is for the offense to score touchdowns and objective in defense is to stop the offense to score touchdowns. And, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to score uh, still to this day to score more touchdowns than anyone who's ever stepped on the CFL football field. I mean, that's, that's an honor. And I mean, that, that's a feeling like no other. And uh, that touchdown right there, uh, the ball is right here to my left. I can see it right now. I mean, it, that's the most, that's the, that's the, that's the most special play I've ever made in my football career because that's something that can't be taken away from me. Will the record be broken? I don't know. I'm not going to say one day. I don't It's, it's going to be tough, but the fact that I can say uh, to this day, it's been what, since 2007, I have more touchdowns than anyone ever that's ever stepped in the CFL football field. That's truly special. And it wasn't all just me. Uh, like I talk about the two quarterbacks, not other quarterbacks, the offensive linemen, the coaches. There were a lot of people, of course, my parents and brothers and sisters. There's a lot of people uh, that went into that touchdown right there. It just wasn't Milt Steger. And especially with the touchdown catch that broke Alan Pitts' record for most receiving yards in CFL history. That one was a little bit closer in terms of who is two and three because you had just tied it with the 16 yard touchdown catch and then broke it with the 92 yarder. And especially it is appropriate in the words of Rob Black. The, that is the record breaker and appropriate. It's a touchdown <laughs> in 2008. Now being, that being towards the end of your career, when you looked back on that record before it was broken, did you find that there was going to be a possibility that someone would catch up to you? Obviously G Roy eventually broke it in 2012 against Winnipeg, mm -hmm. but, or did you feel satisfied in knowing that you had leapfrogged a CFL Hall of Fame or a Kenyan Football Hall of Famer and knew that whether someone broke it or not, that that was going to be something that you were going to cherish forever. Oh, without a doubt. You, you talk about Alan Pitts. I think Alan Pitts is the only receiver to hold the three major receiving records at one time with, with yards, uh, receptions, and touchdowns. So the fact that I was able to, to, to break one of his records is an honor. And I knew, uh, especially G. Roy, and, and I thought maybe Arlen Bruce, if he could have played a little bit longer, there were some guys who were going to, catch that record but the fact that I was able to break one of Alan Pitt's records that was an honor that was that was that was a pleasure I mean he was a special player and I know uh your generation really don't know much about Alan Pitt you may know because you did some research but him and Doug Flutie their combination when I first got to the CFL uh 95 96 uh when he oh 94 90 when he was in Calgary it was something special he was something to watch every single game he was a special player so the fact that I got, got an opportunity to break his record was, was, was truly an honor. And now with looking back on when the record was broken, I guess it was eight years ago now against Winnipeg. Talk about the relationship that you have with Giroy as, you know, you obviously you guys didn't play against each other on the field at the same time because he was also a receiver, but what did it mean for someone like him to break that record against Winnipeg, but for you to be able to be there to witness it and, and share in that experience with him? It, it, it was almost like my little brother breaking it. You know, uh, G. Roy uh, was a great player. And when he first got to Winnipeg, you know, he, he had to slow down a little bit. And he'll tell you this story. G. Roy in training camp was the best receiver. And that's why he earned the spot. But uh, he, he started uh, hanging out a little bit too much. And at one point, they had to put G. Roy in the practice roster because he wasn't doing his job. And uh, that next year he came back, it was a wake-up call. He went out. And he started playing G. Roy Simon football. And as they say, the rest is history. So it was special to see G. Roy uh, grow as a person, as an individual, uh, to see him still grow to this day. But being there in person was truly special. I was fortunate to be there with him and his family because uh, he was something to see as a player, 
Uh, and just to see him, and I, I saw him before the game and just talking to him and seeing his interaction, I could see how now he was influencing the younger guys the way Robert Gordon and myself influenced him and Albert Johnson and those other guys. So, I mean, it, it's a legacy that will live on forever because I'm for sure the players he influenced will go and influence other players. So it was truly special being there and, and being able to honor him as he broke one of my records. And it is and at that time, I remember watching it and saying, you know, if Milt would have played a few more years, like he would have boosted his record. But obviously, <laughs> it's so great to be able to share in that camaraderie. And especially knowing that when you become good friends, or when you have that relationship, and especially with being former teammates, because even growing up as a kid, I didn't know that G. Roy had played on on the on Winnipeg, you know, growing up because I just saw him with the Lions. He is so right. successful with having won the Great Cup. And in 2011 and also having won the great cup in 2005 I be, or 2006, I believe it was when that was also in mm-hmm. Winnipeg, but that seeing the origin of that early 2000s bomber team really fascinates me a lot because there was so much talent with Arlan Bruce and yourself and G Roy and, and Robert Gordon and Kahari Jones and Mike Sellers and all these amazing talented players. And, and it is obviously unfortunate to look back and not to see a great cup, title etched in your guys's name but at the same time knowing that there was that talent in winnipeg is something that is can a not be taken for granted and two and b is truly special to behold because there was such an enjoyment to watch that team play and to watch the success you guys had despite not having done it and i think that's one of the best things about being a blue bomber fan is being able to watch great teams and being able to share in the victories and the defeats with others around the community. And again, which is why that great cup victory was so important because um, are you a baseball fan? I'm a New York Yankees fan. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I remember when, when, when talking with Ed, he's a big, big major league baseball fan. He was talking okay. about, you know, records being broken and, and curses falling and droughts ending. And we were talking about a song that was written by a man by the name of Eddie Vedder who wrote a song Mm -hmm. called All the Way, live in Chicago, talking about the one day that the Cubs would finally win it all. And and we kind of made a comparison to, and I'd thought thought about this since listening to the song, that Winnipeg is kind of like seen as the Chicago of Canada and that there is a bit of that (laughs) that analogy between the Bombers finally winning and the Cubs finally winning. Now, obviously Mm -hmm. it wasn't a hundred years, thank goodness it wasn't. Right, right, right. But but there is that that special camaraderie in Winnipeg and and obviously in Saskatchewan as well, you know, credit to their fans for being so loyal Mm -hmm. for having one third the great cops of bombers do but what was <laughs> what was the the most special thing that you felt during your time in winnipeg when you were a player whether it would have been in the beginning of your career or whether it would have been towards the end what was the thing to you that made you know okay winnipeg is an extremely special place to be a part of well i i, I think it was uh the experience i had with the fans I I had never experienced anything like that. I I didn't know fans uh, could be so loyal, so nice, so rowdy, so, so mean, so all at the same time. And it was just like, man, this is pretty cool. You know, after the games or or doing practices or doing training camp, there were so many fans there, so many young fans. Oh, it was just a array of different type of individuals. And that was just something that was just so special to me. And that went on for 14 years, not just my first year, not just my last, every single year, every single day, there was something special about fans. And sometimes it was the same fans there and different fans. It would be fans bringing us treats, bringing us cookies. I'm like, this is more than just football. This is a community. This is an organization that's, that's, that's built around his fans, not the players. Without the fans, there is no Winnipeg Blue Bombers. So that was the thing that really allowed me uh, to realize how how much fun or how uh, how, how super uh, this community and this town is being uh, close and interacting with those fans day in and day out. And especially seeing the feeling and the sentiment of that community and that camaraderie amongst the fans here in Winnipeg and across Manitoba is something that I've been fortunate and lucky to feel and experience myself with having been at the Great Cup last year, seeing the amount of people that came together despite having traveled across the country to watch the game. And then also when going back home, the Great Cup parade and Portage in Maine and people leaving school, leaving work to just rally around people partying in Portage in Maine after the game had been played before the parade had actually happened and seeing people hugging each other and, and being so happy is one of the best things I think 
about being a part of Winnipeg's community. And that's what makes me so glad to be a Bomber fan and what makes me so glad to have witnessed so many great players play throughout the years in my life and yourself being one of them. And obviously Kevin Glenn and having watched other great players like Terrence Edwards and Charles Roberts, mm. Fred Reed, Andrew Harris, Matt Nichols, yes. Zach Kalaros, many of the kickers. It's truly a special place to be in the CFL Winnipeg. And I would argue it's the best place to play in the CFL and they have the best fans. No question. But Without a doubt, without a doubt, 100%. I can say it, I'm not working on TSN now, so I can agree with you 100%. <laughs> now, before we get to the end of our time here today, Milton, I want to ask you two more questions, and this mm -hmm. is related to both sides of the football. Now, the first is, who was the funniest teammate you ever had? Charles Roberts. A every question you probably ask, ask me is, Charles Roberts is going to be the answer, so. <laughs> Char Charles Roberts. The guy was... And I wish everyone out there could experience being in the locker room or just sometimes in the huddle with Charles Roberts. Some of the things he would say and some of the things he would do. Sometimes you would get mad at him, but most of the time you were just laughing at him. He was he was the, the greatest athlete I ever played. And I always say this because he, Charles never worked out. And people know this. He never worked out, never ran, never trained. But once he stepped on the field, there was no one better on the field as Charles Roberts. But you talk about funny. The guy was hilarious every single day. You never know what you were getting from Charles Roberts day in and day out. So he was definitely the funniest player I played with. Now, the second question is, who was the toughest individual player that you ever had to match up against during your entire career? Oh, a guy named Gerald Vaughn. Uh, you probably don't know him. Uh, he finished his career with the Ottawa Renegades. Not the Red Blacks, the Renegades. That's how far we have to go back. But the best days of his career were in Hamilton. He was a halfback. He was about 6'2", about 210 pounds, and could run like a 4'3". So he was strong. He was a tough matchup. Uh, if I wasn't on my 8++ plus plus game against him, you know, when we played against him, I wasn't going to catch many passes. So he, he brought out the best of me every single time I played against him. Eddie, Eddie Davis was real good, too. And Eddie Davis was a totally different type of player than him. He was a smaller guy. More for now, you know, not as, as as strong as physical, but he was also a tough player. And with that, we are concluding today's episode. And Milt, I can't express in the bottom of my heart the amount of of privilege and how blessed I feel to have interviewed such a great bomber player, an icon, you know, million dollar smile like James West would say, <laughs> and also the best looking man to have played in the CFL. There really, we go. We got, we got to end with that. We got to end with that. <laughs> I appreciate the time you've had today to, to share your wisdom and stories and some of the great things about being a part of our amazing community here in Winnipeg. It's been amazing. No, thanks for having me, man. Thanks for having me on and good luck and continue. I don't know what you're going to do in the future, but you seem like you have a, you, you have a knack for doing this. Of course, you can't take my job because you don't look as good as me, but I'm sure your future is bright and thanks for having me on. Well, everyone, thank you again for listening to today's episode with legendary bomber Milt Stiegel, the all-time leading receiver or the all-time touchdown king in CFL history.